Well, again, blessed Epiphany to each and every one of you. Epiphany doesn't always fall on a Sunday, so it's nice that we get to celebrate today, the day that the star appeared over the manger, and Jesus was identified as the king by those three kings of Orient. They actually, we don't know if they were actually three kings or a dozen kings. They, we just know they brought three gifts. And we figure everybody comes with a gift. And so we say there were three kings and we needed a title for the song anyway. <laughs> we're using this story to kick off a sermon series we're calling, Is Jesus Still Relevant? Is Jesus Still Relevant? We all know people who no longer attend church even though they were raised in the church, even though their parents did their best to instill in them Christian faith and values, but something changed. And our children and our grandchildren, our brothers and sisters, so many of them are largely ignoring the church and claiming that it is irrelevant to their lives. Let me just ask that question. How many of you in your immediate family have somebody who was raised in the church but no longer attends worship? Now look around. Now this is an issue that is pertinent to today. I have two brothers who have stopped attending worship, but when I ask them what they believe, they'll still tell me that they believe in Jesus. And many younger people I've talked to will say something similar. They say they don't like the church. They don't feel like they need the church. Frankly, they don't want to be associated with the sins of the church. And we have to confess that we've been guilty of being judgmental and condemning and people disassociated for those reasons. But they still think Jesus has some merit, although they don't think about him all that often. For that reason, we're going to spend the next two months really digging into who Jesus was the scriptures for the season following Epiphany focus on revealing Jesus to the nations. We just finished Christmas. We had a, a wonderful celebration of the birth of the one we call Lord and Savior. And now it's time to, to recognize that he grew up and to get to know him. And I urge you as we go to get to know him again for yourself. To keep an open mind. Sometimes we get stuck in, in thinking we already know the answers. I've been to church. I have it all figured out. And we stop learning. We stop growing. But the new year is a time to grow and learn and be open to seeing Jesus again for the first time. And the magi, the three kings, the wise men, are a good place to start. We know a little bit about the wise men. We know that they were Zoroastrians. That was a Persian religion of the time. They believed in, in forces of good and evil, kind of like a yin and a yang. They studied the stars diligently. They knew when anything changed in the night sky. They were something of a cross of modern-day scientists who investigated the natural world and also spiritual seekers who wanted a deeper truth for their souls. I think most of us would describe ourselves in similar ways. We'd say that we're interested in the truth, that we want, to, we want to find the truth just as the wise men were seeking it. And I would say that even those who have left the church, those who might say that they're agnostic now, they would also describe themselves as truth seekers, that they too want to know what is true in the world, both in the natural world and in the spiritual world. I think a lot of people who call themselves agnostic are just, they don't want to commit to anything because they don't want it to later be proven wrong. And so they'd rather stay uncommitted and open to receiving truth from maybe unconventional sources. However, the question for our agnostic friends is, when they do find something true, are they willing to commit to it? And are they willing to let that truth change their lives? The Magi were truth seekers. They were open to new sources of truth, unconventional sources, but they were also willing to commit to that truth when they discovered it and let it change them. We need to remember that the Magi were not Jews. They didn't know the Bible. They didn't know the Hebrew God. They didn't know that they didn't know the Hebrew God. They didn't know the stories of Abraham and Moses. They didn't know anything about the promises of a Messiah or the history of the Jewish people. Yet when they saw a star appear, they believed that the birth of a king in a far-off nation, a nation other than their own, had something to do with them. 
They believed that they should at the very least make the difficult journey to find out who this person was and pay him respect. That's not an easy thing. It is not easy to be open to new ways of thinking, especially when it comes to religion. We like to be settled. We like to think we know what's true and stay there and resist anything that would threaten or challenge our way of thinking. But the Magi were open, and maybe we can be open too. I'll tell you a story. My, uh, my wife, during one of her pregnancies, had terrible morning sickness, and nothing that, that we tried was, was helping her at all. But we had a friend at our church who was a, an acupuncturist, and he said he's had great success in helping people with morning sickness, and he would, he would love to, to help her. Now, I'm a pretty conventional guy, and I was pretty skeptical about acupuncture that putting needles in your arms and hands could have any effect on anything. And he was a friend of mine. He become a, became a friend, and he would tell me about his acupuncture business, and I would smile and nod. <laughs> and in my head, I'm thinking, no, I don't think so. I like Western medicine. I like hard science. I've been helped by Western medicine. I'm not really open to this Eastern stuff. But my wife was pretty sick and pretty uncomfortable. So she decided to take him up on his offer and receive an acupuncture treatment. So we drove to his practice and I left her there for about an hour and he put needles in her arms and hands and guess what? It worked. So what do I do with that? What do I do with that revelation, with that epiphany? If I let it, it radically changes my understanding of the world. I can either write it off as a fluke or with an open mind and an honest spirit, I can acknowledge that healing can come from unconventional sources, that it can come outside my traditional understandings. The Magi investigated a revelation that was outside their traditional understandings, outside their own religion. And when they found Jesus in Bethlehem, they were radically changed forever. They had the spiritual courage to not only pursue a new truth from an unlikely source, but then to commit to that truth and become believers. And I would like to say to our agnostic friends and family members, that maybe the church is that unconventional source of truth for them, that they would be invited to have an open mind and see what this old institution, 2,000 years old, what truth it might still reveal to us today. We Christians claim that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And lately, we've been criticized for that claim especially by those who've left the church. How could one man be what the whole world needs? Now, we don't claim this to be dismissive or condescending of all the great religions and cultures of the world. In truth, we acknowledge that if something is true, that it is from God, regardless of where that truth is found. And we believe that God does speak through other religions and other cultures truths about himself, and we're not afraid of that. But we believe that all truth ultimately points to Jesus, who is the revelation of God to humanity. We believe that everyone was created by the same God, and that God loves and cherishes all people all over the face of the earth. He loved the Jews in Israel through whom he gave the world the Savior, but he also loved the Zoroastrian Persians enough to put a star in the sky so they too could find their way to God. God loves the Hindu people and the Buddhists and the Muslims. He loves people who find hope in Western practices. He loves people who find comfort and spiritual nourishment in Eastern practices. He has given to all people the same gift of his son, Jesus, that all people might know him and love him. 
That's why he didn't reveal Jesus just through the Hebrew scriptures and prophecies so that only a select few could understand. But he put a star in the sky as a sign to the entire cosmos that the child born in Bethlehem was a gift for the whole world. And then Jesus grew up and Jesus created a church, a group of people committed to following him and sharing the good news of God's love for the whole world. The church is meant to be like that star of Bethlehem, shining to the world, inviting all people to come and receive the gift of God in Jesus. The church's good works are a beacon to the world. Whether it's the hospitals that we've started throughout the the hundreds of years all around the world to bring healing to the nations. You ever notice that most hospitals have religious roots, roots in Christianity? In fact, a lot of them even have Christian-sounding names, although some of those are being changed. But like our own St. Francis has its roots in the Christian faith. Or think of the feeding ministries, or the homeless ministries, or the adoption agencies. Our own church has Lutheran Family Services, provides assistance to one in 50 Americans. We have Lutheran World Hunger, feeding thousands all over the world. We have Lutheran Disaster Relief, helping people recover from natural calamities. And we have a reputation of staying and helping even when the publicity and the news cameras are gone. Or Habitat for Humanity that Eric shared with us this morning a Christian organization that follows Jesus by helping low-income people build and afford their own homes. These are the stars of Bethlehem, inviting the world to come and see what's behind it all. Jesus, God's gift to the world. He is the gift of God, bringing healing and relief to the poor and the outcast, and he's been doing it for thousands of years. Jesus is the gift the whole world is welcome to receive if they're willing to have an open mind. To receive Jesus, you have to have an open mind. Be willing to let God speak to you in both conventional and unconventional ways and receive that truth, whatever source it comes from. Think of the difference between how the the three kings of Orient and King Herod received the news that a new king had been born. They didn't know it was Jesus. They just knew that a new king had been born. When King Herod received this news, it says he was frightened. And he had to ask the scribes to tell him about this prophecy of a Messiah that was in his own scriptures. It was clear he was not a truth seeker. He wasn't on the lookout for new revelations from God. He wasn't open to what God might be revealing to the world. His mind was closed. And when he discovered the place of Jesus' birth, he didn't celebrate. He organized a genocide to kill all the boys under two who might be a threat to his understanding of the world. Herod didn't want to change. He liked things just the way they were because in the way they were, he had the power. And how often throughout history have Christians been like this, clinging to power, closing our minds to the way God might be doing a new thing because we've become comfortable with what we know, and change threatens us. I think Matthew includes this story of the wise men from the East to warn us not to be like Herod, not to close our mind to the new work God might be doing. Rather, we learn from the wise men who weren't threatened by this new truth and this new king that was born, but instead they left what they were comfortable with to at least investigate what God might be doing. And when they found Jesus, they were profoundly changed. Maybe it was the testimony of the shepherds. Maybe it was Mary and Joseph telling them the story of Jesus' birth. Maybe it was that celestial sign in the sky, the star over the manger, marking his birth. But when they came to Jesus, they were changed. They gave him gifts, gold to represent his royalty, frankincense to represent that he was from God, Myrrh to represent that priestly role he would play between humans and God. And they bowed and they worshipped. We know they were changed because of their decision to put their own lives on the line to protect the newborn king. Rather than return to Herod and reveal Jesus' location and threaten his life, 
The Magi defied the king's orders in a foreign land and returned home by a different road. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when Christ bids a man, he bids him come and die. That is to say, when we come to believe in Jesus, Jesus will ask for our lives in some way. He will ask us to die to ourselves in some way. He will ask you to give up something, to make a sacrifice. The Magi made the sacrifice. They gave up their understanding of the world, and they risked their lives to protect this baby king. What might we need to give up so that we can proclaim Jesus to those who have largely given up on the church as the way it is, to those who no longer understand who Jesus really is? What might we Christians be called to sacrifice in order to proclaim the message in this new age? It will be different for each of us, but if we are followers of Christ, we will be called regularly to make sacrifices, to die to self, so that we might serve the mission of God in Christ. And that message needs to be proclaimed because so many in our world really have no idea even the basics of who Jesus is. They have been confused or misled, often by the church itself. We are complicit through our sins in misleading the the nations about the truth of Jesus. And just as Herod didn't know his own Bible, How often have Christians become lazy in our own faith and we've lost that ability to share the good news with confidence and love. And we bear the burden of the church throughout history. We are not church alone. We're not isolated. We're connected to every Christian across the face of the globe. And when the church sins, it weakens all of our witness. But God's message is still there for any who will hear. And each of us need to pay attention to the signs God is giving us so that we might be led again to Jesus, that we might, with open minds, receive new revelations from Christ and then, transformed by Jesus, that we might shine the light and be that star so that others can find him too. When we were baptized The pastor handed us a lit candle and said these words, Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify their Father who is in heaven. Paul wrote to the Philippians encouraging them to shine like stars in the world by holding fast to the word of life. God so loved this world, this world, that he gave his own son to the world, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. May our minds be open again to all that Jesus would call us to this year. And may we be like that star of Bethlehem, leading open minds and open hearts to the Savior of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.